want it on now or no, later? Right. Thank you. <coughs> Are you going to stay to be able to put it on? No. No, I can okay. come back whenever you want. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening. I'm delighted to introduce uh, <coughs> Sudi Alegre, who is a human rights barrister um, <coughs> and has worked as a human rights lawyer for more than 20 years in various, okay, I guess as a lawyer um, in practice and for various NGOs, including Amnesty, okay, I mean, so, sorry, uh, NGOs and international organizations, EU, Council of Europe, <coughs> the UN, and I, <coughs> I guess mostly, sorry, mostly related to tonight's talk, uh, she has also set up an organization called Island Rights Initiative, and I apologize on the uh, flyer, in case any of you saw the flyer, the UCL, uh, link should not have been there. It should have been the uh, Island Rights Initiative, um, which is, um, as far as I understand, an initiative uh, that's relatively new, that's still upcoming, uh, which wants to deal with the specific problems that small island states or nations have, and one of the issues is particularly climate change, which is what we're going to discuss today. Thank you very much for coming. Thanks very much. It. Thank you, and thanks very much for the invitation uh, to talk today. So just to give a bit of background um, as well about the Island Rights Initiative, it is very much, as been said, um, a start-up. So it's something that I started up about a year and a half ago, uh, having spent 20 or so years working in international human rights law, but being from a small island in the middle of the Irish Sea, the Isle of Man, um, I decided uh, and realised doing some work at home that there was a gap and particular issues that small islands face um, around human rights and governance and also getting their voices heard on human rights issues internationally, um, which is quite unique. And so over the last year and a half, I've brought together seven other associates from small islands uh, around the world. And I have to say, I'm a bit disappointed today that one of my associates, um, Angelique Pupuno, who is the real expert on climate change uh, and human rights, is currently in Poland at the COP for the AOSIS. So I, I, I'm a bit disappointed that she's not here uh, to be able to field questions. Um, but I'm delighted to be able to talk and to talk in an audience of people who I'm sure as well have a lot uh, to say about the issues of human rights and climate change that affect small islands. So last month, obviously, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, issued their special report on the impacts of global warming at 1.5 degrees at sea above pre-industrial levels. And that focus was on strengthening the global response about the threat of climate change. And that report, when it came out at least, was a real wake-up call, uh, with global warming likely to reach those levels in just over a decade, 2030 to 2052, if it continues to increase at the current rate. But the current position that we're looking at uh, with the sum total of states' nationally determined contributions puts us on track for about three degrees warming, so more than the two degrees that were agreed in Paris and roughly twice this aspiration of 1.5 degrees. So the IPCC <coughs> report suggests that sea levels will rise by between a quarter and three quarters of a metre by the end of the century, even with only 1.5 degrees warming. And that sea level rise will continue beyond 20, uh, 2100 with uh, marine ice sheet instability in Antarctica and irreversible loss of Greenland ice sheet, potentially resulting in multimetre rises in the next hundreds and thousands of years, so looking on a longer term. And if you happen to live on a small island close to sea level, these figures have a very real meaning, and a very real meaning for you and for your children uh, and grandchildren. The report, put, the report points out that increasing warming amplifies the exposure of small islands and low-lying coastal areas um, and deltas to the risks associated with sea level rise for human and ecological systems, and that includes things like saltwater intrusion, flooding, and damage to infrastructure. And crucially, what it says is that a reduction of 0.1 meter, meters in global sea level rise would mean that up to 10 million fewer people would be exposed to related risks. So potentially 10 million fewer people at 1.5 degrees than at 2 degrees. But as I said before, at the moment, we're looking at 3 degrees. <coughs> 
What that means for small island states like Kiribati, the Maldives, the Marshall Islands and Tuvalu, which are the four most at-risk uh, small island states, with a combined population of around half a million people, is that 1.5 degrees is already too much. So what are the actual impacts of climate change on the human rights of islanders? The scale and complexity of the science and of all the global processes around climate change can sometimes distract uh, from the real impact on the ground, making it easier to ignore what it actually means in human terms. So what I want to talk about today is the human cost of climate change as it's being felt right now in small islands, and particularly small island uh, developing states, and the way human rights law is being or could be used to help provide creative and effective solutions that will affect people's lives now and in the future. Climate change is an issue for all of us, and the human impacts of climate change are already being felt across the world, with droughts and extreme weather events causing food insecurity, <coughs> conflict and forced migration in places as diverse as the Middle East, Latin America and the Arctic. But small islands are really on the front line of these issues, facing particular risks which require careful thought and really complex solutions on practical and legal level. So what do the human rights impacts of climate change look like in practice? So extreme weather events like hurricanes are an example of climate change impacts which have a very clear and direct impact on the right to life of people in small islands. So last year alone, the estimated death toll from the Atlantic hurricane season was, around, was over 3,300 people. And many of those were on small Caribbean islands. So that's 3,300 people in one year's hurricane season. But loss of life isn't the only risk to human rights in these situations. The devastation to people's homes, to the basic infrastructure, to things like hospitals and schools by this kind of disaster has really serious implications for other rights in affected territories. And if you look even at relatively affluent places, the economic and human cost is enormous. So for example, the British Virgin Islands, hit by Hurricane Irma last year, over a third of the island's 7,000 homes were destroyed by the hurricane. I mean, if you can imagine a third of the homes in your uh, country or your community being destroyed. And it's estimated that the cost of the hurricane is $3.6 billion, which is over three times the GDP of the British Virgin Islands. And if you think of the British Virgin Islands as a relatively affluent uh, place, which also has the support, potentially, of the UK, and you apply what that means in a small island developing state or, or in a state or in a place with limited resources, you can imagine the impact uh, of uh, a hurricane of that proportion. And it's not just the devastation and, and the, the physical infrastructure that's a problem, but also in the BVI, guaranteeing security and preventing looting were a real challenge in the aftermath of the hurricane, even things like securing uh, the prison. And this, again, is going to be worse in places with limited resources. Issues of providing basic health services, ongoing education, food, shelter and security following a devastating event like this are particularly difficult in small island developing states. And for vulnerable people like children, the elderly, people with disabilities, pregnant women or girl, women and girls at risk of sexual exploitation, the potential risks to their human rights are even more uh, acute and severe. In some cases, post-disaster recovery has been used as an excuse to remove the, the rights of the population. So, for example, I know there's somebody here who's been working on this. In the island of Barbuda, all the land um, had been held communally. <coughs> so in the island of Barbuda, all land had been held communally since the emancipation of slaves in 1834 by the British who then governed the island. And in 2007, this was codified into law. So the Barbuda Land Act says that all land in Barbuda shall be owned in common by the people of Barbuda, and no land in Barbuda should be sold. 
But following Hurricane Irma, which decimated the island, the government of Antigua and Barbuda used the disaster as an excuse to um, evacuate the population and bring in draft legislation removing communal land rights in Barbuda, Barbuda without consultation. And such a drastic change in land ownership raises very serious concerns for economic, social and cultural rights of the most vulnerable people in Barbuda at this time of crisis. And I think as an example of how the impacts of climate change can be used to affect governance or to remove rights uh, of the people affected. But climate change and its impacts aren't only limited to dramatic events. In some areas, it's the gradual and worsening impact of global warming that's already putting lives uh, and other rights at risk. For example, in the Arctic, it's contributed to increasing um, temperatures, earlier snow melts, and thinning ice packs. For many uh, people in the Arctic, crossing frozen bodies of water is an essential part of their daily lives for transportation and subsistence living. A study on Alaska published in 2014 looked at falling through ice incidents in Alaska from 1990. Uh, to 2010. Those incidents it found, there were 307 incidents affecting 449 people. And what they particularly noted was that subsistence activities like hunting, fishing and gathering, which are critical components of the culture and life of many people living in the Arctic, and travel over fresh and saltwater ice, which was often essential to those activities, FTI, as they call it, events, are an enduring hazard in the Arctic. Residents practicing subsistence lifestyles face relatively high exposure to water hazards uh, throughout the year. And aside from potential injury and death, these incidents were also causing equipment loss, decreased harvest success, and adverse effects on mental health. So a really wide range of impacts uh, from an impact of climate change. More than half the events involved transportation by snow machine, and the mortality rates were markedly higher for Alaska Native people than they were for all Alaskans. And so this study concluded that falling through ice was a climate change-related risk to health and life in the Arctic, which was particularly critical for vulnerable populations such as Alaska Native populations. So again, it's really particularly vulnerable populations that are at the sharp end of the human rights impacts of climate change. For low-lying islands, hurricanes, again, are not the only threat. So looking, for example, at Kiribati, an island nation made up of around 33 coral atolls and reef islands, no more than two metres above sea level. So again, going back to the kind of sea level rises I was talking earlier, they're no more than two (coughs) metres above sea level, but many areas are significantly lower than that. And they're scattered across a wide area in the South Pacific. So in 2015, a tidal surge swept uh, over an ocean embankment and smashed through a hospital and maternity ward uh, in Kiribati, meaning that terrified pregnant women, women who were in the process of giving birth, were having to be evacuated to a school on higher ground so they could be properly looked after. And a 2013 World Bank study on the potential impact of climate change on the Kiribati Atoll of Tarawa gives an apocalyptic view of the future decades for the island. And it highlights all the ways that climate change potentially would impact uh, Kiribati and and particularly this island. Roads are going to be washed away, which has devastating impact potentially on the economy. Degradation of coral reefs would mean stronger waves hitting the coast, increasing erosion, disrupting food supply, increased risk uh, of salination of the land. Higher temperatures and rainfall changes would also increase prevalence of diseases, so increased risk of diseases like dengue fever. And rising sea levels also likely to worsen erosion, create groundwater shortages, and increase the intrusion of salt water into freshwater supplies and agricultural land. So aside from the potential risk of low-lying islands being completely submerged by rising sea levels, the impacts of climate change are already making some islands uninhabitable. 
And this, I think, is the most acute threat from climate change um, affecting small island states and one of the most complex and difficult areas from a legal and a political perspective is what happens when an island is no longer habitable. These are questions, as I said, that raise very difficult uh, and complex areas in both politics and the law on an international and a domestic level. And while internal displacement of islanders within a larger state already poses human rights and security challenges, particularly for vulnerable populations uh, who are most likely to be affected, it's the need for external displacement that poses the most difficult legal challenges. The term climate refugee has become a kind of colloquial shorthand to describe those who are obliged to leave their homes because of the impact of climate change. But while the numbers of people being forced to move because of food insecurity or other factors arising out of climate change is increasing, they're not captured at all by international law definitions which don't recognise this as a category of refugees. But increasingly, cases are being brought that challenge this situation. One of the most well-known and well-documented cases involved a man who had moved from Kiribati to New Zealand with his family in 2007. And when his visa expired, Mr. Te Tiota, and I'm sorry if there's anybody from Kiribati who can correct my pronunciation, please do, claimed that he was entitled to be recognised as a refugee on the basis of changes to his environment in Kiribati caused by the sea level rise associated with climate change. The Immigration and Protection Tribunal uh, in New Zealand dismissed his appeal, but it did note um, the limited capacity of South Tarawa to carry its population being significantly compromised by the effects of population growth, urbanisation and limited infrastructure development, particularly in relation to sanitation. The negative impacts of these factors on the carrying capacity of the land on Tarawa Atoll were being exacerbated by the effects of both sudden onset environmental events like storms and slow onset processes like sea level rise. But ultimately it decided that Mr Te Tota had undertaken what may be termed as a voluntary adaptive migration, so his migration wasn't forced and therefore he couldn't be considered uh, within the concept of refugee. The IPT also looked at the concept of persecution in international refugee law, which usually involves a failure of the state either to prevent human rights abuses being carried out by its own um, agents or preventing human rights abuses being carried out by non-state actors. And so it looked at this question of human, human agency uh, and whether or not that was required in order to classify someone as a refugee. But it did note that this requirement of some form of human agency doesn't mean that environmental degradation, whether associated with climate change or not, can never create pathways into the refugee convention or protected person jurisdiction. So it left a pathway open, but decided that in this case it wouldn't apply. It didn't find that the evidence showed the environmental conditions uh, that Mr. Teitota and his family would face if they returned to Kiribati were so parlous that his life would be placed in jeopardy, or that he and his family would not be able to resume their prior subsistence life with dignity. So they said that there wasn't quite, uh, it didn't quite reach a high enough bar. And importantly, although I think rather controversially, it found that the effects of the environmental degradation on his standard of living were being faced by the population generally. And so there wasn't a suggestion that he was any different from anybody else. Uh, on Kiribati. And they also noted that it hadn't been suggested that the Kiribati government had failed to take adequate steps to protect the appellant from harm. So he couldn't be considered again as a, as a refugee for the purposes of the Refugee Convention. How this case would be considered or how a new case would be considered if those circumstances were changed and if they're changed particularly under the new government in Kiribati would be interesting uh, to see. The case went all the way to the New Zealand Supreme Court, which agreed with the IPT's conclusions. But the Supreme Court explicitly underlined the fact that its decision in this case should not be taken as ruling out the possibility of granting refugee status in another appropriate case. 
So they were certainly leaving the door open and recognizing uh, the problems. And what I think is really important about this case is that while Mr. Teitoto was unsuccessful in his challenge, last year the New Zealand government announced that it is looking into creating a new visa category specifically designed for Pacific peoples displaced by climate change. So he wasn't successful in the courts, but his case and others like it are certainly helping to move the political dial uh, in New Zealand. And as the reality of displacement due to climate change grows, I think there's going to be an increasing need for the international community to open legal avenues to those who can no longer remain in their homelands and how that will operate in the global dynamic around migration more generally uh, remains to be seen. Potentially an even more fundamental problem for small island states is the risk that their territory could be entirely submerged. So international law sets out the key formal characteristics of statehood in the 1933 uh, Montevideo Convention on the Rights and Duties of States. And according to that convention, <coughs> the state as a person of international law should possess the following qualifications. They have to have a permanent population, a defined territory, a government, and the capacity to enter into relations with other states. The phenomenon of climate change and rising sea levels means that there really needs to be on an international level urgent and careful thought about what that means for states that potentially are entirely submerged or on an even shorter term states which are effectively uninhabitable. So it becomes very difficult to maintain that permanent population requirement. This type of state death is something international law hasn't yet had to address directly. And aside from the very practical questions associated with the resettlement of populations, it raises fundamental issues around the right to self-determination enshrined in the UN Charter and, internet and other international human rights instruments. That is the right of all peoples to freely determine their political status um, and pursue their economic, social and cultural development. But what happens to a people when their land literally no longer exists? So some Pacific islands have already taken steps to address the future um, and the problems of resettlement. So the former president of Kiribati, Anote Tong, arranged for the purchase of land in Fiji in 2014, potentially to provide a refuge for the people of Kiribati in anticipation of the gradual uh, submersion of the country. And that land at the moment is being used for agriculture, which addresses the pressing issue of food security uh, in the meantime. So the former government of Kiribati was the first to take this kind of step, but others, including the Maldives and Tuvalu, have also looked into similar solutions. But buying land for resettlement doesn't address the underlying questions of sovereignty uh, and self-determination and what the status of a population and or its government is if they are forced to move onto territory uh, in another state. And while states may be willing to help with resettlement from neighbouring <coughs> countries or countries that they've got strong uh, historical or other ties with, they're likely to be much less willing to actually cede sovereignty over parts of their own territory to another government or another group of people. And while small island developing states are small in terms of land mass and population, they're often very large in terms of ocean area with extremely valuable resources in their exclusive economic zone under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. So what will the legal implications be for those resources when the territory of the EEZ is connected to disappears, or even now as it starts to shrink? Will resettlement come at the cost of control of those resources, um, which is a fundamental uh, issue for the people coming from those countries? At the moment, there aren't clear answers to those questions, but it's very clear that these sorts of questions raise a much bigger issue and a much wider issue than that which is currently being looked at under the head of loss and damage. So how can islands use human rights law to help them? <coughs> 
So SIDS bear the brunt of the effects of climate change, despite the fact that they're relatively small contributors to the problem. The response to climate change clearly needs to be global, but there are ways that small islands are and could use international law, including international human rights law, to push the international community to take steps to reduce climate change and to ensure that the most responsible for contributing to climate change are also those who must be responsible for providing solutions to the human rights impacts, whether those are in practical terms, financial terms or whatever. This is going to need to include support to deal with climate-driven migration and funds to address loss and damage. International human rights law crucially requires that human rights have to be real and effective, and there must be effective remedies for breaches of human rights. But the fact that the cause and effects of climate change <coughs> don't know boundaries makes it very difficult to think of effective remedies in traditional terms of, uh, of territorial jurisdiction and right holders and duty bearers. And so this means that human rights lawyers working in this area need to and are exploring innovative approaches that break new legal ground and cross legal boundaries and, and silos. The recent judgment in the Agenda case in the Netherlands, for example, looked at the way failures to limit greenhouse emissions could be in breach of a country's obligations to protect the rights of its citizens, including the right to life and private, right to private and family life, as guaranteed under the ECHR. And the People's Climate case recently brought suing the European Parliament and Council uh, about the EU climate agenda, saying it doesn't go far enough, includes families from the European Union as well as from Kenya uh, and Fiji. So again, people from small islands are at the forefront of taking these innovative challenges and it remains to be seen how those develop. In 2011, Micronesia <coughs> sued the Czech Republic in Czech domestic courts over its plans to develop a coal-fired power plant, citing the risk of climate change as a transboundary harm that would threaten the existence of the archipelago, even though it was over 12,000 kilometres away. And again, while that challenge was unsuccessful in stopping the development at the time, it did have a political impact in the Czech Republic, leading to the resignation of the Czech Environment Minister and opening up new avenues for challenge by affected states under international law. So just so because that challenge wasn't successful doesn't mean the next one won't be. And Micronesia continues to be proactive in seeking international legal solutions to the issue, including pushing for the atmosphere to be included in the long-term programme for the International Law Commission. And this year, 115 countries expressed their desire for the legal implication of sea level rise to be placed on the active work programme of the International Law Commission, which has been captured in the UN's Ocean Omnibus Resolution. Looking as well at what domestic law in small islands can do, after the Cayman Islands were flattened by Hurricane Ivan in 2004, their new constitution in 2009 recognised the importance of the environment to the islands including constitutional protections for the environment, which go way beyond the kind of protections you see in UK law. So their constitution says that the government shall, in all its decisions, have due regard to the need to foster and protect an environment that is not harmful to the health or well-being of present and future generations, while promoting justifiable economic and social development. And I think in a place like the Cayman Islands, this is very interesting because while the Cayman Islands recognises the environment and the threats of climate change as being an existential threat to the islands itself and therefore makes this constitutional obligation very important, as far as I'm aware, there's no very clear development of what that actually might mean in practice for governmental ob obligations across policy areas. And given the importance of the financial services sector in Cayman, I think it's a very interesting question as to what the human rights obligations and the constitutional obligations are of the Cayman government in terms of developing the financial services sector in a way that protects the environment uh, for now and the future. And I think it will be very interesting to see how that develops and how it can be used. The increasing recognition of the interplay between the environment and human rights has led to similar provisions being included 
in many domestic constitutions and in international instruments such as the European Charter for Fundamental Rights, which hopefully will help with the people's uh, climate case that I referred to earlier um, in the European Court of Justice. These developments could open the way for further targeted litigation with a focus on human rights protections in both domestic and international law. And whether this is being done through domestic courts or with an international uh, approach, for example, seeking an advisory opinion from the ICJ, it's going to need lawyers and policymakers to look outside of their silos and across borders and oceans to explore really ingenious and innovative new ways of tackling both the causes and the impacts of climate change. Last week, Ralph Reganvanu, Ralph the Minister for Foreign Affairs for Vanuatu, announced that Vanuatu is looking into the possibility of suing fossil fuel companies and industrialised countries for their role in creating climate change that's going to be devastating uh, for Vanuatu and other similar island states. And I think seeing such political declarations from countries like Vanuatu really puts small islands on the front line in terms of uh, action and activism to address climate change as well as finding themselves on the front line in terms of the impacts of climate change. But while they may take the lead on the political and legal steps we need to take to address climate change, as the metaphorical canary in the coal mine, we need to heed the warning that they are giving. Climate change is a very serious threat for all of us. It's not just for small islands or for those on the front line. And as such, we all have a duty to find ways of preventing and mitigating it. The answers aren't yet clear, and the response to climate change is really going to involve a huge amount of creativity from scientists, from lawyers, from policymakers and activists to make sure that we understand the seriousness of the threat we're facing and take the steps we need uh, to address it. Mary Robinson, a climate justice activist, the former president uh, of Ireland and U former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, in her book on cl called Climate Justice, focuses on the need for stories to drive change. And I think it's very important to recognise that human rights law doesn't live in a vacuum, neither does environmental law, and it's very much about recognising the realities on the ground. Some of you might have realised and recognised that the title of, of my talk is borrowed from a poem by a British poet, Stevie Smith, which starts with the words, Nobody heard him, the dead man but still he lay moaning. I was much further out than you thought, and not waving, but drowning. I'd like to end my talk with the powerful words of two climate change activist poets from islands from opposite sides of the world who are acutely affected uh, by climate change, really just to drive home that it's important to listen to the voices of the people who are affected. And these two... Uh, poets from the Marshall Islands and Greenland, the Marshall Islands poet people might recognise who spoke at the UN in 2014. Oh no, I'm not going to get there. Okay. <laughs> there have probably not been very many kind of poetry expeditions. Oh no, sorry, that's the making. <laughs> in the planet's history. Sister of ice and snow, I'm coming to you from the land of my ancestors, from atolls, sunken volcanoes, undersea descent of sleeping giants. Sister of ocean and sand, I welcome you to the land of my ancestors, to the land where they sacrificed their lives to make mine possible, to the land of survivors. I'm coming to you from the land my ancestors chose, Ilangaina, Marshall Islands, a country more sea than land. I welcome you to Gadahitnunai, Greenland, the biggest island of Earth. With me I bring these shells that I picked from the shores of Begini Atoll and Brunet Dome. In my hand I hold these rocks picked from the shores of Nuuk, the foundation 
land I call my home. With these shells, I bring with me a story of long ago. Two sisters, frozen in time on the island of Uyai. One magically turned to stone. The other who chose that life to be rooted by her sister's side. To this day, the two sisters can be seen by the edge of the reef. A lesson in permanence. With these rocks I bring a story told countless times. A story about Sister Ma'amla, mother of the sea, who lives in a cave at the bottom of the ocean. This is a story about the guardian of the sea. She sees the greed in our hearts, the disrespect in our eyes. Every whale, every stream, every iceberg are her children. When we disrespect them, she gives us what we deserve, the lesson in respect. Do we deserve the melting ice, the hungry polar bears coming to our islands, or the colossal icebergs hitting these waters with rage? From one island to another, I ask for solutions. From one island to another, I ask for your problems. Let me show you the time. Coming for us faster than we'd like to admit. Let me show you airports, underwater, bulldozed reefs, blasted sands, and plans to build new atolls. Forcing land from an ancient rising sea. Forcing us to imagine turning ourselves to stone. Can you see a glacier's grown the weight of the world's heat? I wait for you, here, on the land of my ancestors. Heart heavy, with a continuous thirst for solutions. As I watch this land change, while the world remains silent. Sister of ice and snow, I come to you now, in grief. Morning landscapes that are always forced to change. ocean and sand, I offer you these rocks, the foundation of my home. May the same unshakable foundation connect us, make us stronger than these colonizing monsters that still to this day devour our lives. The very same beasts that now decide who should live, who should die. Sister of ice and snow, I offer you these shells and the story of the two sisters as testament, as declaration that despite what we are told, Choose stone. We will choose to be rooted to this reef forever. From these islands, we ask for solutions. From these islands, we ask, we demand that the world see beyond ACs, SUVs, their pre-packaged convenience, their oil slick dreams. Beyond the belief that tomorrow will never happen, that this is merely an inconvenient truth. Let me bring my home to you. Watch as Miami, New York, Shanghai, Amsterdam, London, Rio de Janeiro, and Osaka try to breathe underwater. You think you have decades before your home falls beneath tides? We have years, we have months before you sacrifice us again. Before you watch from your TV screen to computer screen to see if we will still be breathing while you do nothing. to end with these women because I think they are examples of incredible activism and they are examples of people from island communities affected across the world who are engaging on the international uh, front and on the human rights front engaging with poetry on human rights. <laughs>
report yes. on the issue of, of Barbudo. And it's more of an update, um, mm -hmm. just so that people who know, I'm one of the lawyers acting for the people of Barbuda in the response to the government's um, changes to the communal land rights. And just to say that, the, the, as you pointed out, the laws were used to, remove, to create a well, a state of emergency was imposed in the immediate aftermath of the hurricane. Um, Irma, to remove the people from uh, Barbuda, which is, you know, the population is just on over 200 people, uh, to take them to Antigua on the basis that there was another hurricane coming, but by the time they had imposed a state of emergency, the government had already known that the hurricane was no longer a threat. But they used that, um, they, they used the law to evacuate the people from the island so that they could start taking steps to change the uh, communal uh, land rights, um, which Suzanne pointed out, you know, enshrined the, the 2007 land, communal land rights, Barbuda Land Rights Act, enshrined communal land rights for people of, of Barbuda. And then what happened in the, towards the end of the year, and this year, was that they eventually passed legislation that has removed communal land rights. <coughs> and it's, it's a subject of litigation, but what happens to a people when they are most vulnerable as a result of devastating hurricanes is that you know they are displaced, they've lost their homes, they've lost their possessions, they can't really fight back. And it's, it's you know, governments using this for their own economic gain, you know, um, when, when people are, are weakest. And, and the other thing that I, I wanted to highlight in the Barbuda situation, which touches on the um, the, the the other human rights breach, um, it's you know it's the right to food, and you touched on the the vast um, economic resource of the sea. Yeah. And of course, it's a small island, so fishing is one of the main economic activities. And what the government did was that it closed the fisheries and it imposed this ban on the um, storing of fish on the island. And you know, one of their, their main export markets is Europe, which is next to Martinique, Guadeloupe, and they're able to export lobster and stuff to the to the EU. So that again is used, you know, as, as a tool to undermine the economic activity of the people. I mean, this is just an example of, of what happens as a consequence of a major hurricane and how it can actually be used as a weapon against the vulnerable other people. Yeah, and I think that that, what's happened on Bermuda, you know, is potentially could happen on a whole state basis. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. Um, so, uh, my name is Natasha. So um, you said that uh, actually some islands have already been submerged. Uh, no, well, I mean, I think that there are. Well, there was one just off Japan recently that disappeared. So not not okay. island states being submerged, but I think coastal erosion has because meant that, that in some places, or at least that they're uninhabitable. Mm -hmm. So there's been sort of internal displacement. Yeah. It's about people being there if they can keep their nationality or not. Um, I, I guess it's not addressed yet, but if, because to have a state you have to have a territory. Exactly. Too. And so if they're submerged when they go to the mainland, even if they have the population, I'm wondering if they would lose their nationality and become, which is... Well, that's the, that's the big question and where I think there needs to be a lot more preparation and work. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you can really wait until it happens. Uh, to so deal with, happen. and one of the sort of proposals has been marking out the um, EEZ already, so starting to talk about them instead of being small island states, talking about them as large ocean states, so sort of marking out their territorial waters, um, but still that doesn't answer what happens in terms of sovereignty mm -hmm. if they move, and as I was saying, the, you know, people in Fiji or in New Zealand may be happy to sell land to allow people to relocate, but if those people then start exercising sovereignty over that land, that then becomes quite a different um, question. And if you're talking about a country that's disappeared 
permanently is you know how long can you maintain this idea of of a state or you know a government in exile uh, but then what happens in terms of the the cultural rights of a people when their their homeland just doesn't exist anymore and those questions you know they do require international legal answers they require thinking about in international organizations um, as I say in a sort of preparation it's it's too late to start sitting around thinking about it as some distant <coughs> possibility that's never going to happen. There needs to be a preparation. Are there, are there already discussions about this, or even just starting to? Discuss? There are academic discussions, but I don't think there's I don't think there's anything concrete, unless anybody else is aware. I don't know of any actual sort of political process, because again, it's it's something that you know will be highly contentious. Um, but there's a very distinct risk that, as with Barbuda, the same will happen on a whole state basis. That a neighbouring country, or you know, the, the exchange for hosting your people will be you give us all your ocean resources. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just wanted to point out that another problem I think that is the brain drain that happens uh, in small islands when you look at, for example small islands close to New Zealand and um, Australia and how the immigration policy works and then they try to attract young islanders who get like trainings or special <coughs> education to be able to live and to integrate into the other societies. Yeah. And so that's also a problem for those that are remaining on the islands because they they have don't have enough like education and man manpower I call it now like, yeah. to act against um, or to have enough engagement against like the, the other countries. So. Yeah, I mean, I think the sort of the human resource question is a big question for all small islands, to be honest. I mean, you know, even if you come from a relatively affluent small island like I do with a you know, thriving business community, if you don't want to be in that business community, then you go away. And pretty much everyone has to go away to study. And then going back, having been away, is always quite, quite a challenge. So yes, I think that is a, a big issue. So it's, yes. <coughs> Hi, um, my name is Marie, and Hi. I just want to offer um, an observation yep. that comes from kind of a perhaps surprising angle. Um, so I currently work in international investment law, mm -hmm. and um, there's two, I think, aspects of the of the field that have an impact on this kind of question. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the first one is there's an increasing, as I'm sure you know, there's an increasing number of disputes under investment um, treaties so in which investors sue states mm -hmm. um, for threatening their investments. and um, one interesting aspect of that is that there are investors suing states for um, changing their environmental policies. So one kind of famous example is state, a state like Spain, which instituted um, renewable energy policy, and then after the economic crash of 2008, changed its um, position because it wasn't economically sustainable. But a lot of investors had invested in renewable energy, and there's a raft of investors that brought um, treaty disputes just to to sue Spain on the basis that it threatened their investment. So that that's a way in which kind of investors can actually surprisingly perhaps bring about um, more protection of environmental rights. And then there's another th uh, trend that I think is quite interesting in which states that are being sued by investors increasingly use human rights arguments to defend themselves. So it's it's more of a of a shield than a sword in that case. But it is, I think, as you mentioned, bringing it you know, into the, the public eye and kind of the political discourse as well. Yeah, no, and absolutely. I think that the field is just it's a question of, of making interesting connections across silos. That's the way the way it needs to develop. Mm -hmm. so, sorry, that's mm -hmm. Hello, my name is Juliana. So uh, you mentioned like an example about how like Cayman Island government were like trying to put some pressure on the financial sector. Well, they're not, as far as I'm aware. Okay. But they, this is in their constitution, and I think it's quite interesting that it's in their constitution. But I, I'm not aware of how it's being actually used in practice. Okay. Okay. No, that's one of my questions. Okay. Like to point out how the financial sector have been background in like companies that are responsible for climate change, but most of them are located in, in some islands. So, yeah, if there's any kind of well, from the government, like 
to the financial sector because they are also like responsible for the problem. Well, that's what I mean, again, about sort of creative opportunities, that I think there are creative opportunities in those kind of places where if you have this constitutional obligation that goes across all policies, then to have, you know, whether it's individuals or civil society and whether it's on a sort of political level or on a legal taking cases level, but to actually press the government to say, okay, this is great, we've got this constitutional provision, so... How does that apply in terms of your policies around the, the financial sector, exactly as you say? And I think you know, starting to use those kind of things, because and whether or not that will be a sort of domestic move, or whether it's something that that requires sort of support to local organisations to have creative <coughs> ideas about how to do things, because there is again, as you're saying a resource problem generally in a small jurisdiction that you don't have people who are automatically thinking about international law. They're just sort of you know, trying to be a jack of all trades and you know, <laughs> have a practice in a small jurisdiction which might cover lots of different things. Um, but I think there are, there are opportunities there. Yes, sir. Yes, you have mentioned that the colleagues went to COP25. Yeah. Uh, and you have listed some how well are the human rights of small island communities represented at these private negotiations? I don't know. I mean, I know that the Marshallese poet who was speaking there, who is the daughter of the president of the Marshall Islands, I think she is the, the current president of the Marshall Islands. So I think um, that there is a degree of, of sort of activists who are present. And I think that organisations like IOSIS, as far as I understand it, are very much sort of front and centre. Um, being very active, how how that results in the outcomes, I don't know, but I think they are hugely active in, in these processes. And I think, I mean, to use an, a, a different um, example in a sort of different international law context, you know, Trinidad and a, and a large number of small island states were very proactive in driving the Rome Statute and the establishment of the International Criminal Court. And I think it's very interesting in that sort of uh, context to see how powerful they can be. And again, while they might be small, they are large numbers. So, you know, when you're talking about sort of voting and driving things potentially at the UN level, you're looking at actually quite a lot of countries. Um, so in those sorts of processes, I think they do have, have quite a drive. And certainly... You know, when I see the work that Angelique is doing, there's a huge kind of youth-driven um, activism which includes both a sort of legal side and taking cases, but also particularly on the political side, cultural side, whatever it is, about awareness raising. There's a huge youth empowerment movement, I think, that's coming out of small island states at the moment on these issues. My question is related to how to activate the human rights uh, judicial system because, for example, there are many islands which are uh, which belongs to one state, for example, in America, and these communities has its own culture, and they 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 are now claiming about how how the state can identify them as a different culture in their own constitutions, but. The Inter-American Human Rights System establishes that when a community or a person uh, uh, was violated in their human rights, they first has to demand it in their own national courts and then go to the interna international or inter-American system. I don't know how is the European uh, the human rights system, but the people, this community should uh, demand their own state, but these states are developing countries, so they are not responsible in the, in the IPCC terms of most uh, global nations. So I think, well, I think it depends, and that's the thing. I mean, and that's why they're using these kind of quite complex and imaginative ways of going, for, particularly in Europe, um, but also in, sort of in the US and places. So, I mean, Clearly, a lot of small island states are being supported by civil society 
lawyers, civil society organisations that specialise in this, they're often not going to be able to do it on their own. The exhaustion of domestic remedies, yes, it's the same uh, in Europe. The case that I mentioned, the People's Climate case, that's going to the European Court of Justice. I don't know if anybody here has been following it closely. I don't, I'm not aware that they've yet <coughs> accepted jurisdiction. I think it's still being decided whether or not um, the case will, will move forward. Um, the European Court of Justice, you know, if you're suing the European institutions, then you don't need to go through domestic yeah. procedures. You can take the, the institutions on as a whole. If you're looking on a domestic level, so if, for example, with overseas territories, if you're talking about Cayman wanting to complain about Britain, or somebody in Cayman wanting to complain about Britain, well, obviously, Britain doesn't have a written constitution, so it makes things nice and <laughs> clear as to what your roots would be. Um, but there is an argument that you would, e I suppose you would either challenge your own, through your own courts, to say that your own legal system was not doing enough to protect you, or if you went through a UK court um, and tried a judicial review, whether it was under the Human Rights Act or whatever, and if you failed, then you would be in a position to go to Strasbourg. So in a sense, if there is no obvious domestic remedy, then you go straight. International European human rights justice apply only to the EU members? No, no, the European Court of Human Rights applies to Council of Europe members. So you have to be a member of the Council of Europe, which is bigger than the, oh, the, the, than the EU. But if you wanted, as I say, to take a challenge from, say, British Overseas Territory about something the UK was doing, if you couldn't find or, or all your legal routes were blocked domestically, then you just go straight to Strasbourg. So you have to exhaust domestic remedies, but if the domestic remedies don't exist, then you can go to the court. So yeah, you have to do everything you can domestically first, it's the same. Um, and I think that the international approach is going to depend very much on, on the circumstances of a particular territory. Okay. Yes, hi. Um, my name is Alexandra Piu. I'm working at the Department of Economics. So I might be the only non-lawyer here in this room. Um, I was, in fact, very glad to come to your talk. I learned a lot and I, I, well, I heard about things that I have never thought before, like this whole story, what happens if an island disappears. Um, I wanted to add two things uh, to the discussion. The first is concerning what was just discussed about what is the initiative of small islands or what can they do. In fact, small islands, I think they are quite clever in a way because they try to cooperate in order to market themselves as small islands. The term small island developing states was in fact coined by small islands who tried to well, market themselves in the United Nations and they benefit from that status, even if it's maybe not a legal status, you know, yeah. than me, um, by getting access to specific funds. Even the Commonwealth now has a new initiative of a um, finance finance hub for small islands so that they can benefit from that. This and the one. human rights hub as well. <laughs> this is yeah. um, So this is one thing. And then the other thing, in fact, I would like to make a case for interdisciplinarity when we are talking about small islands. Yeah. Um, so you talk about the need for legal solutions, for yeah. policy solutions. And um, I think that sometimes there are just, um, that there are just ways that well, things that happen that will prevent these solutions from being realized um, mm -hmm. from an economics perspective, for instance, when we think of politicians in economics quite often, we see them as self-interested actors with a very short-term horizon. I have lived in Mauritius for several years, for instance, and because of climate change, the drinking water problems that they have there become quite acute now. Mm -hmm. So the solution would be obviously a political one. There would be a need for reform, reforming the water sector, yeah. um, trying to maybe well increase tariffs. Yeah. But this is precisely what politicians do not want. They have a short-term horizon. They know that these solutions might exist, but these are long-term solutions yeah. <coughs> about the next elections. So I think that if we come together as academics from different parts and we think about these solutions together, we might be stronger and come up with solutions that make sense and are feasible and maybe just push forward to achieve this change that is so really needed. 
No, I absolutely agree that it, and it's got to be something that's both practical and effective, really, and that involves economics, that involves the law, it involves the science, it, it involves a change in global culture, if you like, so no, I absolutely agree um, with that. Thank you very much, I really enjoyed it. Is that something you uh, yes. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Sophie, and I've spent some time living in Fiji. Um, and the focus on indigenous communities is still very much what, what we would see as basic human rights and in the north of the country. Um, so, like, the. Is it like the, the struggle with this? Do you think it's sort of getting these communities involved with the problems that they do know exist, but they're more sort of striving for their lives instead of participating in sort of international human rights, environmental law, um, on the future level, they see it more as the present <coughs> issues. I obviously think they are involved as one of your your board members is PGM, I think. Yes, yeah, so although she's in New Zealand. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so obviously they're involved, but long term, is it difficult to get these countries involved along with the resentment that they seem to have for like UK to the I think getting the countries involved, probably not. And I know that the Fijian Premier is somewhere else in London tonight mm -hmm. talking on human rights and climate change, and, um, or, or specifically on climate change. I think there is a problem, as you've highlighted, about human rights on a kind of basic level, and that's in a way mentioning the Barbuda case and also talking about security in BVI, that... You know, we can't forget that these things are part as well of, of the issue and they're part of the context on the ground. So I think um, potentially, I mean, if you're talking about civil society um, and, they, you know, they, in somewhere like Fiji, then yes, obviously, there's going to be a lot of civil society that is dealing with basic human rights issues on a daily basis, and as you're saying. I think it's a common uh, problem. One of the things, though that I realised starting to do this work is that in many places they're actually they're more interested in international support on this issue uh, and in international legal advice or international political support um, because that kind of gives them an extra boost. They may be less interested in having somebody come in and talk to them about right to liberty or human rights and policing or human rights and elections, or whatever it is. So there, there can be that sort of um, tension, if that's what you're sort of yeah, talking yeah, about. Yeah, that sort of gets in the way of, of, develop, of development that could, that could happen. I think it possibly gets in the way in terms of civil society engagement. But as I say, it's possible from a, a cynical perspective to say that you know for the governments it, it's actually you know having this as the agenda means that you can talk about this and not talk about that so you know and both are very important for the futures of their of their people if you like so I, it's not necessarily an either or but um, it doesn't mean that because you're dealing with that there isn't all the other other issues you're talking about if that makes sense yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm not an economist, but I, I was just wondering, because you talked about investing in island states, um, they would probably invest in health sectors, right? Like they cannot, what, do, what would they specifically invest in? Maybe adding infrastructure or providing health? Yes, I mean, well, one of the big things is sort of climate adaptation. So I think one of the, one of the issues about the islands being submerged is discussions about sort of building... Um, houses and building towns kind of on stilts, if you like, so building infrastructure that will be able to overcome that question. And so there's a very big discussion around what can be done about adaptation and, and mitigation. And how can, you, how can you convince a potential investor to um, invest in, in something that might be destroyed due to weather changes? Well, that's a very big big yeah. issue and that's one of the things on the international level is about responsibility yeah. and loss and damage and about the, the polluters having to pay up to help those that can't adapt if you like so they don't necessarily want to that's where I think the, the international pressure and also legal action potentially 
comes in. Um, another issue is around insurance and a sort of global insurance fund for dealing uh, with that. But again, you know, yeah, you don't. I mean, insurers aren't going to stick their hands up and say, "I really want to insure um, all your property on a low-lying island that's about to be submerged," um, unless somebody else is putting money in. Um, so that is that is one of the key. Key problems. Yeah. Can I just wait on this because the um, Bermuda example um, mm -hmm. could be could be used in this assessment because in response to the hurricane, we had the UNDP um, coming in and doing a sort of risk assessment of the location of the population in what was a sort of village in the path of the hurricane, and so there is a plan to relocate the village in, on another part of the island that is not in the path of the usual path of the wind. And I suspect that this sort of response to hurricanes and possibly um, the risk of submersion is the sort of economic um, investment or infrastructural development that is one of the consequences of climate change and hurricanes. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just have a direct question on this. When I mean, this is also connected to I think foreign aid, which is still yeah. being paid to small islands. And then I'm wondering just about the issue of sovereignty and like small islands in climate negotiations and everywhere else. They want to have a <coughs> sovereign voice and they want like a strong like state sovereignty, but th that doesn't really go together with like a lot of foreign aid, aid or a lot of mm -hmm. money that is poured into the countries from, from donors or like somebody who just wants to help them. So I'm not sure if that undermines kind of their <coughs> leverage in negotiations or like in raising their voice. Possibly, and I think, I mean, I think the other issue is that sort of, you know, with traditional development funding, it's very difficult to necessarily know what development means in a very small, sort of, in a very small state as opposed to development in a big country where you're sort of talking about industrial development, etc., which then raises out all that load of other questions um, about climate change impacts. Um, so yeah, I think it does raise challenges. And I mean, the, you know, I referred to the um, British Overseas Territories. One of the things about Brexit is that the, the territories like um, Turks and Caicos I think, and um, I'm not sure which one, which BBI other one. Does BVI also, also get? It is an overseas territory. Yeah. yeah, no, they both are, but but I'm not sure if BVI, I think BVI has also had some EU funding. So they get EU funding, particularly around climate change adaptation, even though they don't qualify for official development assistance for the UK. So the UK funds sort of St. Helena, Montserrat and Pitcairn, and that was one of the big issues that came up. Uh, with the hurricanes last year was that Anguilla and BVI, who were really devastated, the UK was stuck sitting there saying, well, we can't give you money out of the development fund because you don't qualify because of your GDP. Uh, yes, but we've just been flattened and we're in overseas territory. Um, and that's one of the things, as I say, related to Brexit, is that they will lose an avenue of funding outside of the UK and because they're not independent states, they also can't apply for any funding internationally elsewhere. So it's a kind of, well, if they're not eligible for UK funding, although they did sort of find a workaround finally uh, after the hurricanes, but if they're not eligible for that funding and then they're not eligible for anything else because they're not sovereign nations, then they're, they're sort of stuck in the middle. Um, I have a question building on the, um, so my name is Natasha, I'm studying here um, yeah context of corporate rights and justice and political science mm -hmm. degree. Um, I'm building on the theme of cooperation. Um, I was just wondering if channels of communication have been opened up, for example, between um, uh, small island states and other states that might also be affected um, by climate change, for example, states that will see increased uh, risk, of, risk of desertification or um, uh, states with territories that are also sort of low, low lines, for example, Bangladesh whether that's on an activism level or government level? I mean, I don't know in great detail. I mean, I think on the, the, you know, the climate change negotiations level and on, the, and on the activism level, I mean, certainly if you look um, particularly like at the work of Mary Robinson, then she's you know, engaging with climate justice activists across the, across the board. And I think there is, as I say, with this um, 
video that I was showing, it was about the fact that climate justice activists are reaching out across borders, uh, and there is a huge amount of support, um, I think, for that um, in civil society um, to sort of build those bridges. Because, yeah, it's, it's not only islands. Uh, my name is Mike. Uh, do you believe that ultimately we will be able to solve the problem of the elephant in the room, which is the large countries who have major investments in fossil fuels uh, and are doing, let us say, only a little to try and resolve it, even this country, by opening up fracking, has developed a new way of using fossil fuels. Um, is, there, is there a way other than the moral way and trying to shame such countries uh, when the head of the great free country of the world is in denial about fossil fuel? Is there a, is there a potential there, do you believe? Well, I'm an optimist. <laughs> I'm a human rights lawyer, uh, which means I'm partly, well, yeah, I'm partly doom laden and I'm partly an optimist. Um, and I think you have to be an optimist. Um, and as I sort of said at the beginning, you know, this isn't just an issue for small islands, although they raise particular issues. Um, it's really an issue for all of us. Uh, but it is something that requires a cultural shift. So it's not just about government policy, it's also about how people live and how people want to live and how people recognise that they need to live. And that then also dictates the governments that they elect. At the moment, we're clearly on a bit of a challenging trajectory, both on climate change and on human rights, um, really. But I think um, one of the things that is inspiring about the cases that have been taken, as I said, is that even though they haven't been successful, they have had political impact. And the cases aren't going to sort everything out, but if they can, you know, just keep chipping away, tipping the balance. I mean, something has to give. I mean, th th there's and there's also no point giving up, really, because th what's the point of giving up? Uh, you have to hope that there will be change, but it's not easy. <laughs> Maybe that's a very good concluding <laughs> point, <laughs> positive one. Thank you very much. <laughs>